we have a distinguished panel here, and I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves. Um, Avinash? Thank you. There's no PA. Oh, okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, so I'm Avinash Eddy. I'm a product manager at Nutanix. Um, for those of you who don't know Nutanix, hyperconverged. Uh, I think there's a lot of talk already about that. So uh, uh, director of product management, focused on platforms, but uh, been with the company for two years. Um, can talk about pretty much anything from a technology standpoint there. My name is Arjan Tuberman. I work for ITQ here in the Netherlands. Um, mainly on VMware and um, storage show. Yeah, that's my. Hi, Gijsbert, or William for all the English-speaking uh, people <laughs> out here. Um, I'm, uh, I'm with Certo. I'm responsible for solution engineering for the Benelux and um, Nordix. Um, Certo, for those who don't know what it is, uh, software-defined recovery software. Thank you. And finally, Chris Evans. I'm an independent blogger, consultant, analyst, uh, covering storage, so, um, storage cloud, and virtualization. And I am, of course, um, Howard Marks, the Ivan Pipanyak of uh, storage. <laughs> and you know, I, I, I think you know we can. You know, we're supposed to talk about hyperconvergence and containers and those other shiny new objects. Um, and I'm sure that. I annoyed somebody with my hyper-converged presentation. Um, so where do you guys feel hyper-converged fits, and what pieces do you think are missing? Clearly, Avinash doesn't think any pieces are missing, but you know, the rest of you hopefully will say something interesting there. Sure, I can start. Um, so where hyper-convergence fits is really within uh, the enterprise in general, right? So where we're seeing a lot of traction is middle enterprise markets. Um, you know, one of our largest customers, for example, is the largest retailer in the United States. Uh, they're running, you know, north of 300 nodes in, in a cluster. Um, you know, they're running pretty much every retail store in the United States um, as you know, every retail store that they manage in the United States is running on the back end, and Oracle database that's running on uh, Nutanix. So, from a hyperconvergence standpoint, you know, I don't think there's a workload or an application that doesn't fit into the hyperconverged market. Um, as far as what's missing, to answer the question, um, I think somebody mentioned, you know, what's the role of SDN, for example, in, uh, you know, and how does that integrate with the hyperconverged market? I think that there's you know, not a, I wouldn't say there's a gap there, but there's integration effort that needs to happen there uh, specifically. Uh, you know, partners like, for example, the likes of Avaya and, um, you know, Broadcom and so on and so forth uh, that are already innovating in the SDN space and, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, up and coming upstarts, if you will, who are innovating in the space uh, will s solve some of the, some, some of the SDN kind of uh, uh, solutions. Uh, and it's a matter of integrating these solutions together to really solve the networking piece of the equation. Uh, if you go up the stack, I think there's uh, a lot of stuff that hyperconvergence can uh, do from being application aware. Uh, things like, you know, how does, you know, uh, your large databases, exchange, and so on and so forth, integrate into a hyperconvergence stack and really provide the user uh, from a visibility standpoint on the end-to-end -end stack, you know, starting at the network on the bottom, uh, all the way up to the application on the top. So, you know, how does the end-to-end -end pieces really integrate from an hyperconverged standpoint? I think there's, there's a lot of work that can be done there uh, that is being done, you know, either through an ecosystem uh, kind of solution or, you know, uh, natively through a hyperconverged uh, hyper platform as well. So there's a lot of work there. Specifically on the SDN side, I think I will make the argument about um, you know, um, for example, what's important in SDN, right? Like, so there's layer two connectivity and stuff like that, but really it boils down to things like micro-segmentation, right? That's the real key that SDN brings to the table. Uh, and what are we doing to solve the, uh, so the, the micro-segmentation part of the equation? I think there's, there's a lot of work being done in that segment alone. That's where NSX is seeing a lot of traction, for example. Um, and so how does the hyperconvergence stack fit in there? So there's some work to be done there as well. So. Um, beyond that, I'll let the rest of the panel uh, comment on some of the advances. 
where I see um, something that should be done within hyperconvergence is um, probably object storage. Um, because um, a customer where I'm at at the moment, um, a big hospital, does a lot of um, imaging. Um, and I think there's something to be done there for the hyperconverged market. Maybe they don't have to do it themselves, but they could at least offer some sort of solution where it can all fit together. And um, yeah, that's where I think it should go. Yeah, yeah, from where I sit, that's one of the problems with hyperconvergence is, you know, if we're saying we're going to use the storage within the server, then if you've got very large quantities of not very heavily accessed data, it doesn't work. That, you know, the hyperconvergence inherently is scaling roughly linearly. And, you know, we have compute heavy nodes and storage heavy nodes, so there's a cone there, but outside that cone, we've got problems. Yeah, I just um, I just re-echo I guess what you've already said, but I think scale is part of the issue there that we haven't got Howard. You know, we haven't we haven't necessarily got the ability to scale to hundreds or thousands of nodes yet in some of the solutions that are out there, and 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 that's that's I think one of the things that we need to to make sure we have going forward, and the ability to manage all of that effectively. So I'd like to add w w one more thing that I just thought of. I th I've seen the, uh, the I think, hype convergence that uh, Hans called it the other time, I think it was in Tegelplux as well. Um, what I think right now is missing, and, and uh, so I, I can see that not all the hyperconvergent uh, uh, vendors can, can integrate like everything and add object and add SDN and add everything else. Um, what I think right now is to make the platform more open so that the other guys that are doing SDN, that are doing object source, can integrate within that platform, making it even more hyper, hyper converged. Yeah, well, in terms of scale, the, the problem is that the hyper converged guys are limited by the cluster, maximum cluster size of the hypervisor they support. So, you know, having a storage layer provided across multiple hypervisor clusters starts getting very iffy. Um, the other point that I think is interesting is for, for Ariane and Chris, who are out in the field with real users, is anybody really 100% virtualized? No. <laughs> uh, no, I'd agree with that too. Um, I think there's always some reason why you don't. You know, there's always going to be something. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, just like we shouldn't, we wouldn't expect any other technology to come along and take over virtualization. Why should we expect virtualization to take over all physical servers? There's lots of reasons why you might want to keep, you know, dedicated um, equipment that you, you you don't want to touch. We still have mainframes sitting out there. None of that's really, you know, part of the x86 migration. We never moved away from a lot of that. So there's no reason to assume that everything has to be virtualized. Which I know you see 100% <laughs> virtualization. Uh, no, actually we don't. So we absolutely see, um, you know, uh, workloads being physical and, you know, while, I, while I'll admit that Nutanix doesn't have a play for, you know, uh, non-virtualized hardware, uh, there are hyperconverged solutions in the market that do uh, play in the uh, non-virtualized segments as well. So that's absolutely something that's uh, relevant. Uh, to the earlier comment about scale, I think uh, one thing I will add is, you know, if you're talking about a virtualized environment specifically, the limits don't just apply to hyperconverged players, it applies to non-hyperconverged players as well. So, you know, you take a non-hyperconverged solution like, uh, you know, say EMC or NetApp, uh, the same limitations of virtualization limits as far as cluster size absolutely apply to those players as well. So hyperconvergence in terms of scale doesn't actually impede the limit of scale uh, compared to non hyper converged solutions. So I think that's definitely up. One, one exception to that. If I've got a VMAX and 96 vSphere hosts in three clusters, then that, it's still three clusters. Sure. But if they're three hyper converged clusters, then I can't just vMotion from one to the other. I have to storage vMotion from one to the other. And there's a big difference between moving the memory image and moving the data. 
another thing is that we, um, um, Nigel will probably agree, see even more um, bare metal installations of Linux because of containers. So that's also something I think that um, hyperconvergence needs to well, we would talk pick the speed up. Oh. Okay. Container storage, but I don't know anything about it. We'd have to drag Nigel up here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think it, it's interesting because, like Nutanix make a play that um, the hyperconvergent stack is all based on Google, Facebook, and those kinds of people, um, and they are rocking it with containers. Now you're going to get me on my soapbox because the difference between Google and Facebook and you is user density per application. If, if you have a million users per application, then you can afford to build resiliency into the application layer. But if you look in the average corporate data center, you don't have 10,000 servers running one application you have 10 servers running 1,000 applications. And, and when we, we get to the, we talk about um, pets and cattle, and servers should be cattle. Applications are pets, right? You know applications are pets? Because applications have somebody in the business side of the business, not the IT department, who's the application owner. Just like pets have owners. And every application is a delicate flower. Servers should just be cattle. They're crap. Um, but you can't, build, you can't build resiliency into an application that's the HR benefits calculator that three people in HR run. That's very important, but only three people run it. The cost of testing every time you had a patch to that application to make sure that it still took care of server failovers would be way more than the cost of buying a VMAX to run that application on. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a, that's a resilient solution. <laughs> so, so, you know, on the, on the subject of unique applications, for the past 427 years, we've been hearing about VDI as a storage application. And we've been hearing a piece of advice that came out of VMware that it's a best practice to have dedicated storage for VDI. Can we all agree that that's shite? <laughs> that, 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 that day has passed and you needed dedicated storage for VDI just because your old storage was all disk and too slow? Uh, yeah, I think, I, I, we, I think pretty much everyone will agree with that. I don't think you need dedicated storage. I think VDI was a unique case when it first came out where, um, you know, uh, you know, we all take for granted that we all have laptops, uh, you know, in our hands and that we get the performance when we need it. Uh, you know, more and more laptops today, I mean, percentages, if you put your hands up, how many of you have laptops with SSDs on it today? Pretty much everyone in the room, yeah. So. So, you know, it's, it's taken for granted that you're going to get this dedicated performance of an SSD to your dedicated desktop. But VDI was unique in the way that when you virtualize that, you didn't get that dedicated performance. You got shared resources and stuff like that. So, you know, storage had to evolve to use uh, these shared resources in an effective in a manner for VDI. I think, you know, pretty much every storage vendor here has solved that VDI problem over the years. So I'm not going to say that you need a dedicated storage for VDI anymore. That's a, that's a solved problem. Every vendor here has solved that in some way, shape, or form. Couldn't agree more. No, same here. So what I would just add, add that to that, uh, how it is, I think putting dedicated storage was a lazy solution. It was a quick, it, lazy solution. I need lots of IOPS, especially of a flash box. Look, I can put in a flash oh, box. Really, and, and it's wonderful. And it, it was wonderful from their perspective, but it was a lazy solution when actually the, the solution was to come up with something clever software-wise that actually looked at the I.O. and said, how could I handle this in a better way? You know, I could cache it. I could do all sorts of other more intelligent things. And then you could do stuff where you deployed it on JPods, which a lot of, uh, just at least one very large bank who did that, and it was a much, more ch much cheaper solution. So we've, we've talked about hyperconvergence, and frankly, I think we've talked about hyperconvergence to death. Um, 
But what are the other trends you guys are seeing in storage? And I certainly have a short list myself of you know, the, the things that are popping up in storage that I think are important. Where do you guys see that? And I'll come in at the end. I'll let the other end start this time. Thank you. Uh, um, so I think, you know, if you look at it from a technical perspective, clearly, um, and I, I presented on it today, so everybody's talking about, Chris talked about the death of disk, we talked about flash moving in, um, and naturally, um, th that's going to start off as a corner case, but we're going to see that become something that I is, is yeah, so it's, it's, you know, it's just going to become an adoption path more than anything else. Um, so that's good. I think within that, I think there's some still, still some good techno technological improvements that can come along. Um, you know, we were talking slightly offline uh, towards the end of the pre previous presentation about NVMe and form factors for plugging those devices. Um, I think the interesting bit with, with the evolution of that will be the fact that storage becomes more fragmented. So rather than have to sit, stick it on external external shared arrays, there'll be a lot more pushed into the server, a lot more caching, a lot more permanency of the data in there. Um, I think I didn't see Enrico's presentation, but I'm, I know he talked about the divergence. I think and the fragmentation of of having one big box and having it all spread out. So I think we'll see more of that, more of the object type stuff. I think overall, I'd I'd hope that we trend towards the idea of just treating all storage as objects, so that we don't have to worry about LUNs, volumes, any of the physical side of things, and we we focus a lot more on. on <laughs> <laughs> Remember, I didn't see your presentation, so I could be, I could be violently agreeing with you. I don't honestly know. Um, yeah. But I think things although, like... Although, you know, a VM object is very different from an immutable object. Absolutely. So there are, you know, there's, 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 there's a definition of what an object means in that instance. Um, but we are seeing s technologies that are coming along to, to correct that, like, um, you know, like VVOLs and so on. And I, I hope that we get to a point where we start saying that we're looking at the service we apply to the data and not the physical construct. So we start saying, I need QoS, I need IOPS, and we just we stop thinking about the physical side of things. So uh, as a uh, storage agnostic software vendor, I, uh, I, I do have an opinion about storage. So um, like, like he said that before, I think, I think storage will move more to a, um, an offering-based Solution. So exactly asking, okay, I want IOPS, I need availability of this kind and, and such and so, and then I get that. I mean, abstracting it completely from the application or let the application decide it for themselves. I mean, l looking at all the technology in, in the cloud apps and uh, a good example is, is how, how Netflix does their servers with, with uh, uh, their applications. I mean, we've seen many examples of AWS having some issues. Um, I think we recently had one, before that one we had multiple mores um, and and like all like how those applications solved it actually by themselves by using automation by by testing it to death and by actually uh, destroying all the software on a on a regular base just to test how it responds you can see more intelligence going into the software itself um, so it's more it's more getting an getting a storage offering out there incidentally um, I don't think um, Netflix did particularly well last weekend yeah. I don't think they actually recovered at all from from the out, the outage or so they've obviously got so yeah exactly so I think they've got a little bit of pl they've, they've done a lot but they've still got some work to do well that yeah there's there's multiple examples there's one that 200 database servers died and actually nobody actually noticed it so there are many examples of that but still they test it all the time yeah 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 I agree with them uh, I think fee falls um, things like object, um, making sure that someone um, can pick what he needs um, and it gets there automatically, that's where it should go and where it's going already. Yeah, so I'll agree with, uh, you know, object-based storage uh, being a design principle for pretty much the storage solutions out there. Uh, I will also add that a few things, like so for example, uh, one thing I'll add is storage needs to, um, y you know, I think you touched upon it, NVMe as a technology is coming up, but NVMe is an extension, if you will, to SSDs. There's a lot more uh, technology advances that are coming down the pike. So, for example, um, NVDIM, as an example, is the next advance from NVMe. So, you know, instead of having... Uh, storage which is SSD based or PCI based, you have storage that's coming s directly into DIM slots. Uh, and so what you see is, you know, not just 
the storage players, but the technology innovators like Intel building storage directly into servers. So in many ways, you can kind of see uh, you know, Intel and chip manufacturers are building all the storage technology directly into the server side of the equation, which kind of shows you the trend in which the industry is heading. It's moving away from centralized storage and it's moving towards server-based storage uh, eventually. So, so that kind of technology improvements will, uh, will sort of help as well. Uh, one other point I want to make is, you know, being VM aware. So virtualization, like you guys all said, is not necessarily, you're never going to be 100% virtualized, but the world is moving in the virtualization direction. Um, and, you know, storage technologies need to evolve away from LUN based storage to being v more VM aware, right? So storage needs to be more VM aware. Uh, you no longer can have uh, functionality like deduplication and compression and all applied at a LUN level where it has no, no awareness of a VM or anything within that. So to, to recap, I, th I think we're talking about two pools of ideas. There's the short term, where VM awareness, VVOLs and equivalents from Hyper-V and KVM that allow us, then allow us to do QoS, because QoS at the LUN level for a virtualized system doesn't make any sense. I usually say doing QoS at the LUN level just reduces the size of the neighborhood, but you still have noisy neighbors. Um, and then there's the longer term moving, you know, the the PCIe, NVMe, next generation flash. The problem is, if we actually are moving into the server, there's a whole nother software layer that we're going to need because servers are inherently unreliable devices. And so if we're saying we've got persistent data in servers, we got to cluster that because that server is going to crash and you can't have the data trapped in it. All right, I think that brings us to an end. Thank you very much for attending Tech Unplugged. It has been a pleasure for those of us who have been here on the stage such as it is and heckling. Our deepest thought, thanks, to today's organizer and our great friend Enrico. Thank you, sir.